uh, hello everybody, good, good afternoon. So afternoon, right? Yeah, it's sort of uh, nearing good evening, I think. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the session today. I hope you've uh, been enjoying all the sessions from this morning and yesterday sessions as well. How many of you, is this is the first summit over here? All right, okay. It's great to see repeats, people coming back again and the first time is as well. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jaya and uh, this is uh, Vamsi. We are part of the application services BU uh, and uh, we work with uh, applications and on OpenShift to help customers realize their dreams. In today's session, we will look at how to build a comprehensive service architecture with Red Hat OpenShift and Red Hat Application Foundations. Um, Red Hat OpenShift, I think we've all heard of it frequently. Anybody who's not heard of OpenShift, I'm just joking, okay? Uh, application Foundations is basically providing a foundation for customers to be able to build your applications on top of OpenShift. And of course, it can, you can use it to build on VMs also, but we see a lot of value for customers to build applications on top of OpenShift using these uh, two primary technologies. Uh, in today's session, we will look at microservices and APIs. I think um, we've heard about this uh, a lot of times. I think it's not uh, new to any of us here. And what are the various challenges that we face over here? And what are all certain, perhaps certain technology approaches uh, to address the challenges that microservices and APIs bring? We will ho have a look at the cool demo. And uh, uh, at one point in time, we will request you to keep your mobile phones ready because you're going to help us to you know, actually do the demonstration as well. Uh, Vamsi also will walk you through some um, customer use cases and reference architectures as well. With many of our customers and yourselves moving towards uh, microservices and API-centric applications from a monolith, uh, speed, agility, and efficiency become very critical, right? That is one of the reasons why we adopt microservices as well as API technologies. I'm just gonna check. Uh, am I audible, Tamak? Because it's a little, <laughs> it's a little different here. I mean, you can hear me, okay, all right, thank you so much, okay. Uh, so as enterprises uh, start building applications using the microservices architecture and also using APIs for extending their functionalities, the data, their applications for access uh, by other uh, channels for the customers or partners or any of the external channels, channels, right? There are quite a number of challenges that uh, they would face. Some of the challenges could potentially be because of this uh, complex architectures could be tracking hundreds and thousands of microservices, uh, managing all of those API endpoints, securing those API endpoints, um, and securing uh, communication between these individual microservices. Uh, how do we monitor and manage network communications between all of them to ensure all of them are functioning as they should? And also, when you are looking at an API, API being the, the digital business, uh, face of your business, uh, it becomes very important that those APIs are discoverable for your external customers and, um, and for your partners as well. I'm sure this is a very, very you know, small portion of the challenges, that, and I'm sure all of you have many more stories to tell, and we would love to hear that after the session. But uh, just, just like a, you know, perhaps the tip of the, uh, the so-called iceberg. One of the options that, uh, a couple of options could potentially be to address this uh, is using service mesh and API management. Uh, service mesh uh, helps you uh, to, uh, for primarily, you know, connect your services, to manage all of those interconnects between microservices, and to observe how those microservices are functioning with each other. Uh, and all of this can be done without any code change using um, Istio. I'm sure you would have heard of Istio as part of our OpenShift service mesh uh, product. And uh, the, the beauty of that is that your microservices undergo zero change. It's basically a, a transparent layer on top of all of your microservices. And you're able to, using the Envoy sidecar pattern, um, the Envoy proxy sidecar pattern, you're able to uh, perform observability, uh, traffic management, and security of all of these services. It allows you to, uh, to also you know, adopt a zero trust model, uh, and zero trust security model, uh, meaning that you start with literally trusting nobody uh, within the microservices um, uh, boundary. I'm speaking over that. So, and every, every, every uh, trust between microservices are very consciously made, uh, rather than saying that, you know, okay, let, us, let us go with the flow kind of a thing, no. It's very specifically apply your security model, basically, you know, allowing services to speak with each other in, in a very conscious fashion. 
Um, service Mesh also helps you to monitor how healthy your application is running, the reliability, and uh, with distributed tracing, it also helps you to understand where your potential bottlenecks could be, where is your application slowing down, uh, in which transaction is it taking the most number of time, and all of that, right? So it typically helps you with a microservices um, mesh architecture. API management also is, um, is another approach of, especially when you're talking about API endpoints. How do you ensure that external world can connect with your data and your application uh, within your enterprises and across the cloud in a very secure fashion? <coughs> you can deliver the same services now with APIs. You can deliver the same services not just within your boundary, but across your boundary to partners, uh, to, to other uh, digital channels, could be a mobile channel or some aggregators, right? Uh, and uh, like I said, APIs are your digital access points, and so it becomes important to secure this. And to make it more discoverable, we would definitely need some bit of onboarding, developer onboarding platforms, and analytics becomes very critical, um, because analytics not only tells us how useful it is, and also could also you know, um, turn for a monetization perspective as well. Now, you, now how do we choose? So as you saw, typically service mesh, uh, could potentially be within your organization, within your boundary in terms of how services speak with each other from an internal traffic perspective. But an API management, on the other hand, could potentially be external traffic. How do others perceive me? How do, how do others connect with me to act, um, uh, what do you call, uh, <coughs> access my data and my um, applications? So um, if you put all of these things together, right, we bring the service mesh architecture and, uh, and an API management arch architecture, and basically your internal services and an external services, say APIs and all of your consumers, it could potentially look like that. Uh, you have a functional boundary, you have an enterprise boundary, and all of those uh, services, um, um, as in calls coming in from all of your API consumers. Now this looks like child's play, but we all know this is not the real truth. It is something like that. You have so many of those functional boundaries lying on top of each other, and all of them vying for attention perhaps, you know, okay, I want this data, you want that data, I cannot give you this data. And, and so what happens is that even within our own enterprise boundary, there are so many functional boundaries. What do we mean, by, mean about functional boundaries here? Is that those various LOBs, right? I'm sure within, even within our organizations, um, you would see, for example, you may have a consumer LOB. You may have a payment system. A payment system may be like, you know, exposing endpoints to all of those uh, various uh, consumer uh, systems out there. So there, there is, that becomes a need for a contract even within our own organization. So what we are basically seeing is that API management is not just from an you know, external system perspective, but API management also becomes critical for you to be able to uh, function well within your own enterprise boundaries. So here is where the inter-domain APIs and intra-domain APIs come into picture. Um, I always get confused between inter and intra, so I always think of international flights uh, because I've come from India, <laughs> and that helps me keep the you know this thing in place. So inter-domains being the functional boundaries, these various boxes, right? One, one over here, and these all of these boxes. How do these speak with each other? That is where you will want to apply API management because uh, they have an official contract of how we will speak with each other. And within a particular functional boundary, of course, we already spoke about service mesh, and then we have API consumers, and so, and so basically what we're saying is that you don't have to choose between service mesh or an API management. They all, both service mesh and API management can come together to help you to build a fantastic, um, you know, architecture to be able to realize whatever that, that is in you, need, you need to uh, perform from API management solutions and from a service mesh solution. You would say there is a kind of an overlap, but again, that helps you to apply the policies, the security features, the limits, where you need, you know, internally, externally, so you have that flexibility to be able to apply those functionalities to each of these sessions. So I spoke a lot, so I have Vamsi, my colleague, he will do a demo. You can count the zeros by then. Thank you so much. <laughs> You guys can hear me well? Right, thank you, Jaya. Uh, we're going to do a demo today for the rest of the 30, 40 minutes we have. So just pray that the demo gods are with me because I'm going to do everything live, deploy services, deploy service mesh, and all that stuff. So fingers crossed. 
So the story here is uh, we have a travels company. Those of you who played with KLE know about this example, so no, no surprises there, but it's a travels company which is a typical travel company where you can get quotes about flights, hotels, cars, and you know they have a portal where people can walk into their offices or this online portal that they can book their tickets or you know book their vacations. But this travels company suddenly you know wanted to go global. The number of portals increased, and also the number of services that need to serve these portals has exponentially increased. So they deployed all these services on top of OpenShift. Again, this is a fictitious company. I'm not giving a real example, but uh, on top of OpenShift, but but uh, with the growing number of microservices, the biggest challenge that they had is, you know, they were not able to, you know, see where the calls were going between the services, the observability of the services, the traceability, like wh where is the call starting from, where is it ending, what is the bottleneck, they, they really had that issues, and they also wanted to secure the communication between the services. So what did they do? They chose OpenShift Service Mesh for this, where you know once they deployed OpenShift Service Mesh, they have an Envoy sidecar proxies deployed beside their services that will take care of a lot of functionalities. Uh, one thing before I go into you know command line and a couple other screens, uh, I want to say that you know this enterprise has two business units. For example, the travel agency business unit is the business unit that provides provides the APIs with the details about book, the flights, hotels, and cars. And the travels portal business unit is where people actually access uh, or book. This is the front front end business unit. Let's say that, right? To to keep it really simple. So with service mesh, they could they could really have bring in observability between the services and how I've already uh, you know deployed these services on top of OpenShift. If you see here, uh, all my services are deployed on top of OpenShift. All the all the services that you see in the diagrams, and I've managed them with service mesh already for the purpose of this demo. So I'm going to log into Kiali. Uh, and you can actually get a clearer view of how the traffic is flowing, is the traffic secure, uh, the rate of the traffic, the percentage of the calls between the different services, which version is accepting the calls, and all that. All this is pro happening because these two namespaces, the travel portal and the travel, uh, the travel agency namespaces, are managed by OpenShift Service Mesh. And not, not just that, right? Uh, with uh, with Kiali, you can also see, you know, information about the traffic, uh, inbound metrics, outbound metrics, the request volume, request duration, and all this again is is enabled by Service Mesh, and Kiali provides that UI that you can see. And at the same time, when we go back to distribution, uh, sorry, distributed tracing, you can, for example, uh, sorry about the screen, you can find your calls here. You can pick any call that is traversing through your OpenShift service mesh and can see, okay, where is the call starting from? Where is it going? Okay, for the discount, the travel, the, the call is coming from Voyages. It is taking a total of you know 12.26 milliseconds, and which is the bottleneck. You can find all this information just by managing your services uh, using service mesh. Again, the beauty is you're not adding anything additional to your code here. You're deploying service mesh. It deploys Envoy proxies beside your sidecars, and those uh, those are adding this governance and giving this observability and tracing. But another very very important aspect of service mesh is about the security. So what I mean by security is service mesh by default. If if you have service different services, say all these services as a part of service mesh, no other service outside the service mesh can act can you know call the services. Right. For example, uh, let's say let's go into the cars pod and try to call the travel service. Uh, I have a cheat sheet here, so I'm just going to copy paste. Uh, and so, again, context: cars and our travels API are within the same service mesh. So by default, it, we should it should be able to accept the calls. Right. We should get a 200 and some response from the API. Right. We got a response from the API. You can see the JSON that is there, but I'm going to go to another namespace, which is the analytics, which is not a part of the service mesh, and try to do the same call to the same API, even within the same cluster, 
you either get a timeout or there's no call. So by default, service mesh says, if you're outside the mesh, you're not accessing anything within the service. Within the mesh, you're fine. But that's that's a very simple thing that, that that's happening, right? Even within your service mesh, you don't want all your services to talk to each other. Sometimes you're like, I would only allow ingress from that service. I only allow egress from this service. You can actually create what you call authorization policies or sidecars in service mesh that, that will enable this. One thing I forgot to mention is for the internal traffic here, you can, you can see the traffic generated, right? We've created simulators for the internal traffic that's coming from the portals. That's why you see the traffic. For external partner traffic, we'll be utilizing you guys to generate some traffic for us and uh, we'll go through that exercise later. But uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, yeah, I was talking about how do you restrict even services within your service mesh to kind of say, okay, to have some security rules or zero trust uh, policies around that. So you can either create custom resources or YAML, YAML from scratch, or Kiali is so smart enough that it will analyze your traffic because we have a simulator or when you generate live traffic, will analyze your traffic and you can actually go and say, create traffic policies and it will, I'm not gonna apply in this session, but it'll create traffic policies for you where you're saying, for example, the travels service is saying, I will only accept service calls from the travel portal namespace with the default service account. So it's analyzing your traffic. It sees, oh, this is the general traffic pattern. And based on that, it is creating YAMLs for you. You don't need to use Kiali for this. You can create your own YAMLs, but Kiali actually analyzes your traffic and does this for you. So for all the services, it does what's the expected behavior and you can tweak it. This is a good starting point for you guys to create a zero trust even within the service mesh. So that's uh, that's that's a basic, uh, so you know our travels company is happy, they got the observability, traceability, et cetera, using service mesh zero trust, right? And now they, they became super popular, right? Uh, they've been doing really, really well and uh, they get a request from certain travel aggregators saying, Hey, you know what? We'd like to, you know, bring in more deals through our port through our portals to your, uh, you know, to have your flights, hotels, and everything booked. We'll bring in the revenue, but you have to give us a cut. They're like great business opportunity, but we need to take care of certain things. First thing is they're saying, okay, uh, we need to have a different version of the API for partners. We don't want our partners or the external people to access the same API as our internal portals, and we want to divert the traffic. So they'll, this can be actually achieved with what we call a, a virtual service in service mesh. So virtual service is actually the backbone of traffic routing in service mesh, where you say, for example, you're saying in this particular uh, virtual service, you're saying, if, if my uh, co service calls have these headers, say travels.uk, vrg.it, which are our internal portals, send 100% of the traffic, the weight here, to V1. And when you, for external traffic, based on that you're saying, if, if something is coming from external, I'm not showing the virtual service here for external, you can say, send that to V2. So, the diff, the, so they've decided, we'll send uh, one version to V1 and one version to V2, so let's go and analyze that to Kiali, right? Currently we only have version one, I'm going to deploy version two and let's see what happens, what service mesh does by default. I've not, and, uh, and I'm also telling you guys, I, I still didn't deploy the virtual service, I'm going to deploy the V2 of the travel service now. Again, back to my cheat sheet. This is all, uh, you know, deployment YAMLs and OpenShift uh, custom resources that I have. Happy to share you, share this with you guys after the session. Terminal, terminal. Right, we created the second, uh, the, the V2 version. So what service mesh does by default, it'll take a couple of minutes to reflect here is, what service mesh uh, does by default is, it splits the traffic between V1 and V2, it load balances by default. But that's not what we want, right? You know, just the traffic, the traffic from our internal portals is getting divided between V1 and V2. We need to divide the traffic, just hold on, yeah. As you see, slowly as you see, this number will keep increasing to V2, and both of them will reach 50% at some point, which means service mesh is load balancing the traffic between V1 and V2. Now, what I'm going to say service mesh is, hey service mesh, don't load balance. Send all the traffic that's coming from my internal portals to V1, and I'm going to instruct service mesh, 
using a virtual service, which I'm going to deploy right now. So just, yeah, that number will change to 50-50 at some point. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to, yeah, almost there. So I'm going to deploy the virtual service, which will guide, which will tell Service Mesh, send all this traffic to V1 right now. And uh, OC apply F, apply F. Right, as I've done that, and slowly you will see this 15, you'll see the 50-50 is being load balanced. It'll start reducing as it takes effect. You see the traffic to V1 slowly starts increasing to say it eventually goes to 100 and you, have, you won't have any traffic to V2, which means all the traffic that we are simulating from the internal portals is going to V1. Now I'm going to deploy another, uh, uh, another virtual service saying whatever comes from the partners should go to V2. Uh, we'll shortly see that. I'm going to deploy the services. And uh, there you go, I've deployed that. But before we generate the traffic, I need your help to generate the traffic, but before we do that, uh, sorry. Yeah, something, yeah, let's come back. So before we do that, what I'd like to say is another very important aspect that we forgot is, you know, yeah, splitting between V1 and V2, saying V1 for internal, V2 for external is okay. But we also need to make sure these partners are accessing our APIs in a secure manner. That's where API management will come into picture. API management is, is, is where you know, partners can go and you know, sign up for your APIs. We, with three scale API management, where we've, which we've configured the environment for, they will go sign up using the developer portal here. Yeah, using the developer portal here, they can get their application. Uh, you know, keys and credentials by signing up. They can also refer to the documentation that we ha that they have here. It's, it's mostly like a self-service. You don't want your partners pinging your engineering team every time to access your APIs, right? But 3Scale provides this out of the box. You manage your uh, uh, APIs using 3Scale, and it'll also provide uh, what you call, uh, you know, API keys. So for example, we've created a travel demo partner product which we've managed, where we've managed all these uh, APIs as backends. You'll see that. And uh, you'll see, uh, sorry, the applications. These are the red, blue, blue, green applications which we've created. And these are the API keys uh, that the red application or blue application or green application needs. So when you access the red application here initially, you don't see anything, That's the API is not responding because by default I have not provided the API key. Now all of you remember that the red, the red secret is the API key for it. I will go ahead and uh, you know, go to the deployment and pass this as an environment variable. And let's see if our uh, thing works. The red portal. Secret, save. So this will redeploy the pod after you've, you've given the instructions to it. And there you go. You see, you can, you can start booking your uh, um, you know, tickets, your hotels, uh, flights, airlines, and, and book your holiday, right? Yay. But uh, what I'd like all of you to do is, uh, again, uh, you know, the calls are coming from the API gateway into your service mesh through Istio Ingress. And again, you can configure Istio Ingress Gateway in such a way that you can tell, allow calls into the Ingress Gateway only from certain hosts. That way you know only your partner portals are accessing it. I've not done this as a part of the demo, but that is again doable, right? So the next slide, ah, oh, gosh. So this side of the room, if you can, uh, let me just show one thing. So don't book a complete holiday. Just choose a city and do fine details that will generate the API calls. And uh, this, side of the, this side of the room, if you can use that QR code, and the left side of the room, if you can use the green QR code, uh, just generate some traffic. And uh, let me pull Kiali out. As you can see, slowly, as you guys generate the traffic, the amount of traffic that goes to V2 here will start increasing. See, you guys are generating traffic, and all the calls that you're generating are going to V2. 
the 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 reason we have traffic to uh, v1 is because we have not we have not stopped the simulator for the internal traffic so once once all of you have stopped right you will you will actually see the traffic will stop and another ex other thing i'd like to show if you guys can actually do it again i'd like to open up something and remember we've told we've promised partners that we'll pay something if they bring us deals and if somebody books tickets through their portals, API management or three scale API management platform helps you monetize your API. So I've, I've defined some uh, pricing rules here uh, for the partner product. If you see here, I am saying for the first 10 bookings, I'll give you $1. For the first 11 to 20, I'll give you $3. And from 21 to 100,000 or infinity, let me do it, change this as infinity. I'll give you, say, $10 per transaction. So we'll see which side of the room brings us more revenue today. And uh, you know, go for it. There you go. The red is mine. So there, yeah, see, the demo goes are not with me again. Well, we'll see when it comes up. But uh, yeah, basically, using three scale APIs, you can get the monetization, pricing information, and uh, you know, well, there you go the analytics information. So clearly the green team is doing a good job at bringing us revenue. So kudos to the green team partners there. Uh, you've br brought in $870. Uh, all this information, again, um, is coming through the three scale APIs, the pricing information, the number of calls is coming from the three scale API management uh, platform. Sorry? Ready? Good. So that was your API management, right? You're, you're sending in external traffic, having an API gateway, um, which is your data plane, and the API manager is your control plane, and that's how you're managing your APIs. All looks great, but remember Jaya mentioned how you have to treat your LOBs also as different as consumers of your API, because as the number of LOBs keeps increasing within your organization, what typically happens is, you know, you have to have some kind of a, uh, you know, official contract-based access to your APIs. You have to treat them as your internal consumers, where they can again have their own internal developer portal where they can access your APIs in instead of saying, "Hey, engineer two, can you help me out with with this API?" Your engineer will be pissed. Why don't you, uh, you know, go go somewhere and check the documentation, which we all know will never work. But this, uh, with, with, with three scale API management platform, using open API specification, you can generate documentation and it'll generate documentation on your own, on, on its own. You don't need to generate documentation separately for your APIs. But here the scenario is you want to create, you want to add API management internally too. But uh, the, the, the issue here, here is you don't want to add an additional gateway between your internal calls. So, the, the, the requirement there is, oh, I don't want to have a API cast gateway for internal traffic because that, that creates an additional hop. But at the same time, I want some kind of authentication, analytics, documentation. So with Red Hat, what we provide is uh, a very lightweight web assembly plugin which sits on your, between, on your uh, Envoy proxies beside the services that will contact with the API manager uh, to bring in the API management capabilities. So this will use service mesh or Istio as the data plane and then API manager as the control plane. So what I exactly mean by that is if you go to say, this is again three scale, right? You can actually choose which type of a gateway you want. Do you want you know, the, the managed one or do you want a self-managed one or do you want actually Istio as your gateway, which should be Istio. I don't know why that's, that should have been Istio. I don't think that will work because I, I think some configuration missed out there. That should have been Istio by default. Yeah, this is not recorded, right? 
like I'm trying something here, but but what what we what we will technically do here is you know we we will apply this uh, a custom resource, and this will create API management capabilities between uh, you know travel portal and travel agency, uh, and uh, what is the time? Do you guys mind if I configure and show that to you in in a couple of minutes, or should I just go after the presentation? Okay, let me. Let me try what I can do here. So I've changed the configuration to Istio, which is using service mesh as the data plane. And fingers crossed this is going to work. Uh, and I am going to apply a custom resource. I'm going to open up the file here, which will deploy the Wasm plugin beside your uh, So if you see here, I'll, I'll zoom it up a bit. But if you actually see here, we are actually this is the image of the Wasm plugin, which will which will build the which will build the connection between your API manager and your uh, WebAssembly plugin, and you can provide all types of information about what type of uh, you know authentication you want, how rate limiting credentials, etc. Right. So I'll go ahead and apply this. I'm not sure if this is going to work just because. Something got messed up in between, but uh, I'll still go ahead and try. So what what typically happens? Okay, admin. I need to log into this. So what should typically happen is once I apply that, the traffic in Kiali from the internal portals should go away because they're not sending in authorized calls. There's something wrong with the internet. Or my cluster. There you go. Oh, come on. Come on, Internet. Well, that's. Do you want me to reopen it? No, it's 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 down. Kiali is down for some reason. I'm gonna close this just in case. Yep. Anyway, that's that was supposed to happen, but uh, something didn't work, and uh, I can dance if you guys want. But that's <laughs> that is supposed to work, right? Uh, anyway. So that's 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 what that's effectively what we wanted to show in today's session. Uh, if that worked, that would have been a nicer demo where you know even for internal traffic you would, you would not see any traffic in Kiali. And uh, once we add environment API keys as environment variables, you would uh, you know essentially see again authentication authenticated traffic flowing internally too. And uh, uh, I'd like to go through some reference architectures that you can use with service mesh and API management together. So typically one of the Simple uh, architectures that even we had in, as a part of this demo is you know, you have all the services in the service mesh. You have a composite service which talks to your singular services, and only from externally, uh, uh, the external consumers can only access your composite service, which is like the travels example in, in, in our demo, right? So the API gateway will access the composite service. An API gateway is sitting outside your service mesh. So the API gateway, we, we will we will create the ingress gateway in such a way that the only the API gateway can come into the service mesh. Only calls from the API gateway can come into the service mesh. So and all the external calls will come through the API gateway and then from the API gateway into the service mesh. But that's that's a very simple use case, right? But this is actually the base when you want to have a separate gateway for each type of consumer. This is actually a real customer uh, based in APAC, a banking customer who's using this type of an architecture, right? They have different gateways for different types of consumers, say, for example, partner, mobile, internal LOBs, public gateways. But the beauty that our uh, API management product, 3 Scale, brings to picture is, you know, though you have, you can deploy multiple gateways that we give with our product, but you can have a single API manager that will control all these gateways 
wherever they are located, VMs, bare metal, OpenShift, any other Kubernetes. You can deploy the gateways wherever you want, but you can have a single API manager. So this is, a, uh, this is a actually a real use case where uh, one of our uh, key customers in uh, APAC uses this architecture where you know, they have different entry points for different types of uh, consumers. And uh, another type of reference architecture is you know, having API gateway as a part of your service mesh. So if your requirement is absolute zero trust, I don't want even the API gateway to be outside, then you can have API gateway as a part of your service mesh and then you'll have mutual uh, you know, MTLS between the API gateway and the composite service too as a, and you can you know, define all the service mesh uh, rules and security policies between API gateway and the composite service. So in the first example you saw the API gateway was outside in the next example, you saw the API gateway is a part of the service mesh. And the third example was the one which I couldn't show you guys, is uh, the, Va the Wasm plugin. See, that's, that's something with that today. But uh, is, is the WebAssembly plugin that we've built, the integration, right, which sits with the composite service. And if this architecture works when you want to avoid an additional hop, Say, if latency is an issue, say, oh, my API gateway takes a really long time to respond, and I don't want that extra hop to another, you know, another data plane and then come into my services, you can use this because we have a lightweight uh, a WebAssembly plugin that we provide that integrates our service mesh and API management. So the call, and that will talk to our API manager, our three scale API manager, for getting credentials and for generating analytics and monetization and whatnot. So that's, that's another reference architecture. And uh, for you to try out this demo, which will work, I promise, uh, you, all you need to have is an OpenShift 4.12 cluster. And Ansible, if you guys, uh, how many of you use Ansible? Yeah, so if you, and if you, even if you don't use, uh, there's in, uh, installation uh, steps there. You just install Ansible, there is a playbook. You need to run one command. And this whole setup will be there. I have. Uh, step-by-step -step instructions on what you need to do here. Oh, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, I just want to show. So all the instructions that I've showed here as a, are, are, are there step-by-step. -step. So if you want, really want to try this out, you can uh, uh, you know, go to our solution patterns, run the Ansible playbook, and you'll have everything running. Uh, this is the QR code for it. There are some other resources that you can uh, utilize uh, for this uh, for this particular pattern. But uh, yeah, that's that brings us to the end of the session. A uh, couple of things didn't go as expected, but uh, happy to answer any questions or queries that you guys have. Thank you. I'm going to log into Kiali and see if it works. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. It should it works now, right? See? You guys were you guys were clogging the traffic, so <laughs> <laughs>